Thanks, Herman. Um, so I feel a little bit embarrassed about this because actually I haven't followed all of my own advice about how to write nice presentations in this presentation. Um, I think tomorrow's is perhaps a little bit more polished. Um, but anyway, hopefully this will still be a, a useful and entertaining talk for some of you. Um, I feel like I maybe need to explain the title a little bit. Um, as somebody who's worked in natural language processing for over 20 years now and has kind of seen the field evolve and is aware of what's going on in the field at the moment, I think this title to me made a lot of sense because I think in the field there's a little bit of angst going on right now. Um, people are feeling a little bit defensive about a lot of the changes that are going on and um, a feeling that perhaps machine learning is kind of encroaching on things that we used to think of as our domain. Um, so. In some ways that this kind of feeling of defensiveness is a little bit funny because in some ways, um, you know, natural language processing has really enjoyed great success over the last several years, right? So here are all a bunch of things that have um, come into production in the last few years, you know, things like um, machine translation, um, text prediction that actually has gotten much better, you know, so now not just on your, you know, mobile phone that has terrible text entry that you need to, you know, speed up with text prediction, but actually is good enough that even um, Gmail is using text prediction even when you have like a real keyboard that you can actually use to type effectively, right? So, you know, these things are, are uh, making great strides. We've got question answering, we've got speech recognition, we've got, um, you know, voice activated search and all kinds of things like this. Um, so that's great. Um, and I think a lot of the reason that the field has progressed as fast as it has in the last few years is for the same reason that, you know, lots of other areas of AI have also progressed, and that's because of the deep learning revolution. So what that means is that we're now able to use a lot of standard neural network architectures that are used across a lot of different fields rather than having to have very NLP-specific models, right? So we use RNNs and we use CNNs and we use all kinds of things that other people use as well. Um, the fact that we're using these kind of models means that there's a lot less need for feature engineering, and of course, feature engineering is something that requires a lot of domain-specific knowledge, right? So one of the things that NLP researchers uh, like me who've been around for a long time typically have in our background is quite a bit of um, training in linguistics as well as in computer science and machine learning. Um, Obviously, there's lots of toolkits out there. You know, there's TensorFlow and PyTorch and all kinds of other things that make it very easy for someone to just kind of walk in and build a model that works surprisingly well, right? So there's a much lower barrier to entry um, into building models that work with text. Um, so the question that I'm gonna try and address today is whether, given that, um, knowledge about linguistics and about sort of a domain-specific focus, is that actually still necessary? Um, I've certainly heard some people in the machine learning field who um, seem to uh, believe that at least in the near future and possibly even already, um, you know, there's really no need to know anything about language. We should just be treating language as a completely generic kind of data, just like any other kind of data and apply completely generic tools. Um, you know, we should just be building language models over bytes, um, forget about uh, characters and words, we don't need to know about any of that stuff, right? Um, so, you know, you can kind of guess that because I'm coming from an NLP perspective, I'm gonna try and argue a little bit against that. Um, and so the goals of this, uh, uh, sorry, so, the, so the, before I sort of get to that is, you know, why, why do we actually need NLP in the first place, right? So to understand why I think we still need NLP, right, it helps to understand what it was that we were using it for in the first place, what the, some of that domain-specific knowledge was, um, and, you know, why it was important. Um, that will kind of give us a little bit of background for uh, what it is that neural networks bring to the table. And as I said, I think neural networks have been very important and have really advanced the field in many ways, um, but also that they don't solve everything, right? So why we still need NLP. Um, and the kind of goals of this talk, hopefully, are to teach you a little bit about uh, language in the process of sort of going through some of these models and um, um, things that we've done over the course of, well, in the past and also very recent. Um, and I'm not gonna go into a huge amount of technical detail about anything, so the, actually, probably some of the most technical stuff will be a little bit of stuff that I'll talk about, as I said, to try and teach you a little bit of linguistics. Um, 
but in terms of the machine learning models and, and NLP stuff that's going on now, it's going to be pretty high level. So I'll have a lot of references in here, and hopefully if there's anything in particular that kind of piques your interest, you can kind of go and look at those papers afterwards. But as I said, it's going to be much more of a sort of review talk of lots of different work that's going on. Okay, so let me start by talking a little bit about why did we need NLP in the first place, right? So we certainly had this impression, and I think to some extent I still believe this, that language is special, right? And so some of the reasons maybe don't hold quite as much anymore. So we used to say that language was special because it dealt with uh, discrete variables. So in particular, we were dealing with words. Um, I should mention here that, of course, you know, as I'm talking to you now, I'm using speech, which is not a discrete signal. Um, but in fact, there was this kind of disconnect a little bit between people who did NLP and worked with text data and people who worked on speech recognition and did deal with the messy acoustics and all the stuff with continuous variables and all sorts of stuff that I was just not interested in, um, which is ironic because now I work on speech. Um, and, and I think there has actually been a lot more kind of bringing together of NLP and speech recently precisely because NLP now also deals with word embeddings, which are, of course, continuous and no longer discrete. However, there's a couple of other things that I think are worth mentioning. So language um, is special because it's structured. And I'll get much more into that a little bit um, in just a few minutes. So I don't want to mention too much about that now. The one that I do want to say a little bit about now because I won't well, I'll talk a little bit more about this in the rest of the talk as well, but language is uniquely human. So I think this is a kind of important point, right? In some sense, this is obvious, right? Humans are the only species that we know of that can actually use language. Um, but I think that that actually is kind of a deeper point, right? So if you develop a vision system, there are lots of different species that have different kinds of vision systems that work in different ways and can work for specific purposes, um, right? So our vision system is tailored for particular things and you know, a frog's vision system might be tailored for very different kinds of things. And so if we build a machine learning vision system, uh, depending on what you're doing with it, it might be fine to have it not work in the same way that a human vision system works. On the other hand, because language is specific to humans, it's not so clear that building a language, an automatic language system that works differently from humans is necessarily going to get us what we want, right? So there might be certain kinds of applications where it's good, right? If you want to, um, you know, be able to sort of bring back um, documents on a particular topic from an enormous collection that's too big for any human to actually read. Um, but you know, if you start wanting to do things like question answering and, and, you know, real understanding, you know, building a system that doesn't work in the way that humans do and makes different kinds of generalizations from the ones that humans do is a little bit worrisome, right? So I do think we actually need to consider the fact that humans are really the only example of successful or really any kind of language use um, when we're developing our NLP systems. And so I'll come back to that um, in giving some examples of what we need to think about and when we talk about whether NLP systems are actually generalizing appropriately. Um, so to try to uh, kind of give you an example of, you know, how NLP evolved and what we were thinking about uh, in the kind of dark ages before neural networks, I want to start with an example from language modeling. Um, and it, this is a slightly funny example because actually language modeling is really kind of at the very edge of NLP. Um, it's always been an area where people from machine learning and people from statistics have also all, all, uh, worked on it, um, partly because it doesn't, in fact, at least in the sort of basic versions that I'll talk about, involve a lot of um, very domain-specific knowledge. Nevertheless, I think it'll sort of illustrate some of the things that I want to talk about, and I'll kind of lead into some more complex models that actually do um, have more of the structure that I want to illustrate. Okay, so in language modeling, basically, we have an input, to our model that's a sequence of words, or it could be characters, right? So W1 through Wn. And basically, we want to be able to uh, develop a model that will tell us what the probability of that sequence is, um, the joint probability, or we maybe want to predict what the probability of the next word in the sequence is given the previous ones. 
Um, and of course, we can use this for all kinds of things. As I've mentioned already, something like predictive text completion, which is still very widely in use. In fact, perhaps even coming into more use as language models get better. Um, traditionally, language models were also used for things like speech recognition and machine translation as just one component of a system, which might also have another probabilistic model in there, um, something like an acoustic model for speech recognition uh, or a translation model for machine translation. Um, that's actually not, I mean, some of these systems still work that way, somewhat less now because people are starting to use neural network end-to-end -end models that kind of get rid of that part. Um, however, we're now coming into sort of using language models for a different kind of thing, which I'll get back to at the very end of my talk, which is for pre-training um, for other NLP tasks. Um, so as I said, I'll mention that a bit more later. Okay, so let's, as I said, think back to the dark ages before we had neural networks, right? We have a traditional n-gram language model, and we want to be able to predict the next word in the sequence given the previous sequence of words. Um, now, the problem with this when we're developing a sort of traditional probabilistic model is that this conditioning context, you know, has an exponential number of uh, possible, sorry, the, the possible number of conditioning contexts is exponential in the size of the um, vocabulary, uh, sorry, in the size of the sequence, right? So we have a vocabulary size V, right, and each of these words has V different possible options and we've got N of them, that's an awful lot of conditioning contexts, right? So we can't really collect data for all of the sequences with you know, very long uh, contexts. So what we would do is we would make a Markov assumption. And so we would develop a model, let's call it a trigram model, because the total number of uh, words in, our, in the part that we're actually gonna estimate is three. Right? So we're just gonna multiply together the probability of each word in our sequence conditioned on only two previous words, and just pretend that the rest of the words before that don't matter at all. all right? Um, so we can you know, model this very short sequence by just saying what's the probability of the last word given the previous two times eight given the previous two and so forth. Okay, so that's great. Um, that at least allows us to collect data that's not you know, completely sparse and have a you know, model that's not completely beyond the capacity of our memory to store. Um, but we still need to actually estimate all of these individual uh, probabilities here. And so the very naive way, this is how I kind of start off talking about this when I'm teaching a basic intro NLP class, the naive way that we might imagine doing that if we don't know anything about statistics um, and data is that we might try and just use uh, relative frequencies to do this, right? So we could collect bigram and trigram counts over a very large text corpus and just say, okay, let's use maximum likelihood estimation and just divide the, each trigram by the uh, count of the number of times we saw the, the history. All right. Um, however, you know, even though we've sort of narrowed our contexts down quite a bit, in a very large corpus, we're still going to encounter a lot of rare and unseen n-grams, right? So any particular set of three words is not necessarily guaranteed to show up in that corpus. And as I, again, try and emphasize to my class, right, the fact that we haven't seen something in the corpus does not mean that we should assume that it has a probability of zero because that's going to lead to very bad generalization, right? So what we spent a lot of time doing in the field of NLP and, as I said, also machine learning and statistics was coming up with ways to be more clever about this and better estimate the probabilities of infrequent events. Um, so I'm going to very quickly run through a few of the things that people came up with um, so insight number one here is that we could do something like interpolation, right? So if we're building a trigram model, um, let's imagine for a moment that we have a large corpus, but we've never seen either of these two trigrams in our corpus. Well, nevertheless, at least as humans, we have the intuition probably that we should assign higher probability to uh, this sequence than that one. Um, but also that one reason that we can do that is because instead of looking at the previous two words of context, actually even just the previous one word of context tells us something about this and that it should tell us that this is more probable than uh, beer eaters, right? Okay, so that's great, right? So we have this sort of intuition that higher and lower order n-grams um, have kind of different strengths and weaknesses. Um, the higher order n-grams are sensitive to more context, but they have sparse counts. The lower order n-grams, right, so that's like, you know, bigrams or even unigrams, have only limited context, but very robust counts, right? So the idea was we would basically combine them together 
um, using some interpolation weights. And those interpolation weights um, can be uh, estimated on a development set, and people got into really fancy ways of doing this. Um, you know, you could actually have different interpolation weights depending on the particular context that you were looking at and all kinds of things like that, right? So it gets pretty complicated. Okay, so that's just one thing we could do. Um, something else we could do, um, if you look at this example, um, it says, imagine you see that the language you see has you see a frequently occurring couplet, you see, you see, in which the second word of the couplet, etc. Okay, so I'm not gonna read this, but the point of this example is that the probability, if we just look at the individual word C and the individual word U, they both occur very, very frequently in this example, but the word C nearly always follows the word U. Um, so the intuition is that maybe if we see the word C following some novel word that we've never seen before, that should be much lower than the probability of the word U following some novel word, right? Even though overall C and U occur almost the same frequency in this little tiny corpus, right? And that's something that's not, you know, this is a kind of contrived example, but that's something that actually also occurs in real language, right? So if we think of the word Angelus, right, that doesn't really mean much by itself. Um, it's not very common as a unigram in English, but, um, sorry, it's not, it's not that common, but it's not like totally uncommon, right? We would see that relatively frequently in a kind of general sense in a corpus, but when we do see it, it's almost always following the word loss, right? So if we use our um, just kind of maximum likelihood estimation with the unigram model in the interpolation model, we're gonna over predict the word Angelus in novel contexts, okay? So this type of smoothing, um, knesser nye smoothing, basically is, um, uh, thinks about this and bases the lower order models, the unigram and the bigram models, let's say, um, that we interpolate with our trigram model on the diversity of the context that a word occurs in rather than the strictly the number of times that we've seen them. Um, and this actually is a smoothing method that probably lots of you have heard of because it was actually state of the art until recently and is still sometimes used as a kind of baseline comparison method. Um, I should also say for those of you who are kind of more interested in thinking about cool Bayesian probabilistic models that actually it turns out that you can also interpret Nasser Nye as a hierarchical Bayesian non-parametric model. So this is something I did some work on myself a few years ago. Um, it's a particular kind of model known as a pittman yor process. Okay, so the third um, insight that I want to talk about and I'll actually talk about this a bit more later as well is that when we're trying to predict which words and which sequences will have high probability, that actually incorporating subword information could be helpful as well. All right, so I've come up with this example under the assumption that plecting is a word or perhaps a nonce word that doesn't, you know, you've never seen this before. Nevertheless, as a person you can, who's, who's, you know, speaking English, you can probably tell that the sequence she is plecting should have higher probability than something like she is plection. Right, because in English, this is an ending that happens on verbs, and this is a place where we can stick a verb in this sentence, whereas this one looks like a noun, which is a kind of weird thing to put there, okay? So it's the fact that we can sort of look at little bits of this and determine that. Uh, similarly, here's something which isn't about, you know, verbs and nouns, but it's just the fact that in this situation, we probably have a capital letter here, and so having something with a lowercase letter is not gonna be as probable, okay? so. Those are the kinds of things that are actually not that easy to incorporate into generative models, generative language models, but they were insights that people used in developing discriminative language models. Okay, so, so far you've probably seen that, okay, there's a few different kinds of things that we can, um, you know, have insights about in these language models. However, n-gram models are certainly not the be-all and end-all, and they did have a number of problems. Okay, so the first problem with an n-gram language model is that it does not really model similarity. So if we imagine that there's two words that occur in our corpus, like salmon and swordfish, that again to a human seem like pretty similar words that should probably occur in similar contexts, um, but only one of these words is frequent. So let's say salmon is a much more frequent word than swordfish, and we just haven't seen a lot of data about swordfish. Well, unfortunately, our n-gram language model can't really tell us anything 
about the probability of swordfish given caught to based on the fact that perhaps it knows that the probability of salmon given caught to is high or low or whatever it is, right? There's just no relationship between these two words as far as this engram model is concerned. Right? So they have no way to share statistical strength between these kind of similar words. Right? So intuitively, what I'd like to be able to say is that these words are similar if the contexts where I did see the less frequent word are kind of similar to the context where I saw the frequent word. And I should be able to kind of generalize from that to say, well, maybe the other contexts that I haven't seen it in, you know, it should behave similarly also. Okay. And the other problem with these kind of n-gram models is they have a fixed sized history, right? By definition, it's n minus one, right? Um, the problem with that is that linguistic dependencies can actually be arbitrarily long, right? So, um, if we look at something like number agreement in English, right, what I mean by number agreement is that when we have a noun like kids, we actually have to use a form of the verb here that agrees with it, right? So we can say the kids like books or the kid likes books. I realize this is a funny example to use here because I know that actually there's a lot of Afrikaans speakers and Afrikaans doesn't have number agreement in this way. Um, so I'm gonna give some examples that might be a little bit trickier there, but hopefully everyone at least can, you know, turn your English brain on and get what the rest of these examples are, right? So, so far I haven't shown anything that has uh, long distance agreement. Um, but I can actually extend these sentences, um, right? So it turns out I can say things like, the kids in the shop like books, or the kids in the shop across the street like books, or the kids in the, in the big shop across the street where I bought my glasses really, really like books, right? And it doesn't matter how many words come in between kids and like, I still can't say kids likes, or kid like, sorry, kids, yeah, I can't even say it, right? I have to, I have, to have those things agree, <laughs> right? Um, and so this is kind of a problem when we're looking at an n-gram model, right? Because it doesn't have that fixed sized history. I mean, sorry, it does have that fixed sized history, so it kind of can't um, get this. Unless, you know, obviously we could have a, an n-gram model where n was however long this thing is, but, you know, first of all, that's not gonna work, you know, in terms of estimating it from my data, because I just will have far too sparse things. And secondly, as I said, it's, you know, still fixed to some particular length. Okay, so quick quiz questions here before I um, get to the rest of this. So there's three quiz questions here, and I want you to think about each of these. Um, there's three possible responses to each of these, right? They're true-false questions, but obviously you also might just have no idea what the right answer is. Okay, so first question. Um, I've talked about this idea of long-distance dependencies. I've said n-gram models can't capture these, so is it the case that inability to capture long-distance dependencies like these is a fundamental problem of traditional, that is, non-neural network NLP techniques, okay? So first, how many people have no idea whether this inability is a fundamental problem of traditional NLP techniques? Okay, some people, okay, good. So hopefully I'll, I'll, you'll learn something. How many people think that yes, this is a fundamental problem of traditional NLP techniques. Okay, also some non-negligible number of people. How many thinks this is not a, a fundamental problem of NLP techniques? Okay, good, so we're like a third, a third, and some people I think still didn't raise their hand. Um, okay, let's move on to neural networks, which I think probably more of you know something about. Um, so we have two sort of related questions. So neural networks methods like LSTMs are able to capture such dependencies or neural network methods do capture such dependencies. Okay, so neural network methods like LSTMs are able to capture such dependencies. Don't know? Oh, okay. Few people don't know. How many people say yes, they are able to capture these dependencies? Okay, good. <laughs> Anyone think that they are not able to capture these dependencies? Also good. Um, and finally, how many people, when we're thinking about do they capture these dependencies? Okay, don't know. Okay, yes, they do capture these dependencies. No, they do not capture these dependencies. Okay, there were a lot of people who didn't respond, which is interesting because I asked you if you don't know and you didn't say. <laughs> so I'm gonna re-ask the question, how many people are not sure or don't know if neural network methods do capture these dependencies? 
OK, slightly more people. All right, so hopefully by the end of the talk, you'll have a, at least a little bit of a better idea about these. I mean, I actually don't think there's a complete hard and fast answer to some of these questions. Um, but I'll at least try and prevent, present some evidence on them. OK, so the first one I want to talk about is, you know, are, fun, are traditional NLP techniques able to capture this kind of long distance dependency and the fact that we have kids and like um, agreeing in this sentence, right? So I've said that we can't do that with very easily with an n-gram model. Um, but I would argue that actually one of the things that we spent a lot of time on in NLP was trying to come up with ways that we could capture this kind of dependency. So I think there certainly are approaches that can and do deal with these, um, right? So the, the kind of key insight here is that these, this dependency that I talked about between kids and like is a long distance dependency in an n-gram model and a sequence model. Um, but actually, if we think like a linguist or an NLP researcher, we don't think about sequence models. Well, we do. I mean, we use them for some things. But actually, a lot of what we do is dealing with hierarchical or tree-structured models. Um, and there's a lot of different variations on that, but almost everyone that you would ask, whether a linguist or a computer science person, would agree that, yeah, language has a hierarchical structure of some kind. Um, so I want to kind of walk you through that a little bit to give a better sense of how this works. Um, OK. So, Let's take a look at this sentence again. The, the kids like books. Um, this is not a necessarily a tree structure, as I said, that every linguist would agree with, but it's one that's sort of reasonable. Right? So the idea here is that this sentence, there's actually a latent structure, a latent tree structure, that generates this sentence. And that latent tree structure says, OK, well, this is a whole sentence, and the sentence actually consists of a noun phrase and a verb phrase. And then each of those is broken down further, right? So our noun phrase consists of a determiner. So a determiner is something like the or a or another. Um, and a noun, like kids. Um, and our verb phrase consists of a verb, in this case the word like, and another noun phrase, which in this case just consists of a single ver uh, noun, which is books. Okay. And we can kind of have a model that tells us how this works um, using a context-free grammar. Right, so I've written down the rules of the context-free grammar that would be needed to generate this particular sentence. Right, and we have rules that, you know, so basically what this rule says is, you know, if I have a, an S node in my tree, then I can generate from that a noun phrase and a verb phrase. Right, that, those are the children here. And what I haven't shown here, but what of course is very important when we were doing this in NLP, is that we would actually have probabilities associated with these rules. Right, so you can basically think of this as a generative model and that every time you apply one of these rules, it has an associated probability, and so you multiply together all those probabilities, and so the, by the time you get to the words in the sentence, you have a joint probability for the sentence. Okay? And you can do other things with this kind of model, like do parsing as well, right, by doing inference on it. Um, okay, so that's the kind of very simple version of the sentence. Now, the reason that we're allowed to sort of stick an arbitrary number of words in between kids and like is because we can take this noun here that used to just generate kids, and we can basically replace it with something, I'll call it a noun prime, because it kind of has the same role as a noun, but is a little bit more complex in its structure. Right? So we can basically take away the word kids and replace it with something that serves the same role in the sentence, kids in the shop, but it kind of provides a bit more information and has therefore a more complex structure. And I've added a few more rules here to kind of generate that as well, okay? And one of the things that you'll notice at this point, well, probably haven't, but I'll point it out, right, is that once I've added these additional rules, there's actually a noun phrase here that's generated inside of a noun phrase here. What that means is that this is now a recursive grammar, right? I've, I've got some rules in my grammar that allow me to create a noun phrase inside of another noun phrase, and once I can do that once, I can, of course, continue to do that and generate longer and longer noun phrases, right? And that's how I get, you know, some arbitrary amount of material in here between the word kids and the word like, okay? But I haven't quite explained how this sort of solves this agreement problem, right? I've said, you know, why is it that we think that there's all this stuff that can come in between? But how does it solve agreement? Okay, so if I'm kind of, you know, 
leaving out a bunch of details here, but hopefully this will sort of give you a little bit of sense of how we deal with this. So, in fact, one of the ways that we need to deal with this is by adding some kind of, we can think of them as subcategories or we can think of them as adding features to these nodes in the tree that encode the number. And as again, I'm kind of eliding uh, various things, but we can sort of say, all right, if we have any kind of XP, so that means you know, where X is a variable, so a noun phrase or a verb phrase, those are both something phrases, then it will get its number from the topmost X that's underneath it. Okay, so in this case, we have a noun phrase, right? So that we look for the topmost noun under this noun phrase, that's kids, kids is plural, and so that plural feature kind of gets passed up through the tree to here. And similarly, this verb phrase takes its plural feature from the verb here. Um, but the same thing works in this situation, right? If we look at the topmost noun, often known as the head noun, right, it kind of passes up this plural feature here, and the verb passes up its plural feature here. Okay, so what does that get for us? Well, it then allows us to say that some, if we want to build a sentence, Actually, we don't just need a rule that says a sentence consists of a noun phrase and a verb phrase, but in fact, that a sentence consists of a noun phrase that has some agreement feature on it, and the verb phrase that has the matching agreement feature on it. Right? So it allows us to sort of constrain the two things that go together. Um, and so what that means is that statistically speaking, right, this agreement is no longer long distance. Right? In fact, there's agreement between two nodes that are in fact right next to each other as children of the same node in the tree. Okay, and so that allows us to build statistical models that actually you know, incorporate these um, features at a kind of local level, right? Okay, so we can actually deal with this kind of thing. Um, the problem is that it kind of raises all sorts of other issues, like what I haven't, you know, I've said, oh, this is great, we've now got you know, adjacency between the agreement, um, the problem is that it's now, because of this tree structure, actually much harder to do things like have agreement, or not agreement, but sort of incorporate the fact that, um, you know, there are particular relationships between the words at the root, uh, sorry, at the leaves of the tree, right, which n-gram models are actually very good at, but this kind of model is not so good at. And you also might have noticed that this model is very complicated, right? In fact, so complicated that you know, some of you might have followed my explanation, but some of you may not have even followed my explanation. Hopefully most of you did. Um, but basically the, the kind of um, take home point here is that yes, in you know, the sort of pre-deep learning world of NLP, um, we were able to capture lots of things by building in sort of linguistically motivated inductive biases to structure into our models. So we would have these models that had this kind of tree structures, um, or other kinds of structure involved in order to capture other sorts of things. We could build probabilistic models over those, um, treating them typically as discrete and symbolic representations. Um, but the downside of that was that developing new models for new tasks would often require a lot of you know, specific hand-designed inference algorithms that sort of deal with these compl complicated structures and a lot of feature engineering to sort of know what is important to put in there and what's not. And as a result of that, um, you know, the, sorry, not as a result of that, but as a, just a kind of, as a result of the fact that we're using these kind of discrete representations, um, we have also a restricted ability to model uh, similarity and that does limit generalization um, to some degree, depending on um, the particular um, tasks that we're looking at. Um, okay, so that's the kind of first part of my talk. Um, I think, I don't know, if there are any like very quick questions about that before I go on, I'd be happy to take questions. And otherwise I will go on to the stuff that probably everyone actually wants to know about, which is the neural networks. <laughs> Um, okay, so with that as a sort of um, background, I can now move on to sort of explaining what it is that neural networks actually do and don't bring to the table. Right. So I'm a little bit wary about talking about inductive bias because I feel like as soon as people start talking about inductive bias, it's very easy to say things that um, either make people angry or are accidentally not true. Um, nevertheless, I'm going to venture into that territory, um, but with some 
I'll, I'll give some warnings about it as I go along. Um, okay, so I'll give a few examples of that and then talk about sort of workarounds and why NLP is not, I think, just machine learning. Okay, so let's um, just look at a really simple, um, you know, kind of getting back to the language modeling idea. Um, if we start thinking about neural networks for this, the kind of obvious language model type of structure to use might be some sort of recursive neural network. And I'm not going to be specific here when I talk about what kind of recursive, uh, sorry, recurrent <laughs> neural network I'm talking about. It could be an LSTM, could be a GRU, whatever. Right? But if we were trying to use this for language modeling, we've got a model that looks something like this. Right? And each of these inputs here would be basically a one-hot encoding of whatever vocabulary word we're seeing at that particular time step. Um, and in this particular case, what we're trying to predict as our output would be the word in, that's at the next time step. Um, so the advantage of using this kind of model is that we've basically got the ability to you know, encode, you know, we start with this one-hot encoding, but then we embed it into some you know, high-dimensional continuous space. Right? And that use of distributed representations means that we're able to capture similarity and generalize very well in ways that the discrete models could not do. Um, the practical limits on dependency length are a lot longer than n-gram models. And certainly in principle, and this is kind of getting back to the questions that I was asking you earlier, you know, in principle, we can certainly learn which aspects of history are important. Um, it's not exactly clear, you know, what what exactly the practical limits on dependency length are, but they're certainly you know, longer than the things I was talking about before. Now the question is, when I say in principle, we can learn which aspects of the history are important, you know, do we actually do that in practice? Right? So do these models really implicitly learn the kinds of linguistically structured generalizations that I was talking about earlier? Um, if they do, if they are able to learn them, at what cost? Um, these are, I think, questions of inductive bias, right? So if you have a model that sort of, yes, in principle can learn this stuff, but you need to give it, you know, more data than exists in the world, um, that's not a useful model, right? Um, if you have a model where it can learn these things in principle and it can do so with a relatively limited amount of data, perhaps similar to the amount of data that humans receive when they're learning, you know, that clearly would have a good inductive bias. It's learning um, those st structures, you know, from the same kinds of data and at perhaps at the same rate that humans are doing and, and presumably would be doing that because it has a similar inductive bias to what humans have. So I think unless we can really say, yeah, you know, yes, these models can learn this and they can do so efficiently enough to be useful, then we probably can't throw out NLP and linguistics just yet. Um, so I want to th go through some examples of um, uh, research that people have been doing on actually looking at whether these things do learn inductive bias, or sorry, do learn the kinds of structure that I just talked about. So we can actually ask, you know, what do RNNs actually learn about number agreement? Right? So we can look at sentences that have a target noun and a verb, so I'll show those in red here. Um, right, so that's like the kids from the party last week are, so it's a slightly different sentence, but we want kids and are to agree. Um, something that I'm, some notation that I'm using here is this thing here. So to a linguist, when they see a star, what that means is this is not grammatical or this is not correct for my language, right? So we wouldn't say the kids from the party last week is. That's ungrammatical in English. So that's what this star means, right? So R is okay, is is bad. Um, and then in addition to that, we have these things called attractors, right? So an attractor basically means it's another noun that occurs between these two things, uh, but doesn't have the right agreement. So if we um, look at the word weak, which happens to, you know, it's a noun, it occurs right before the word are. So it's possible in some other sentence, not this one, that weak is actually the subject of this verb, in which case we would say weak is, right? This week is the machine learning summer school, right? We wouldn't say this week are the machine lear learning summer school. So in some sense, this is kind of an, an attractor in the sense that if we, whoops, if we were just, you know, using recency to decide should we do are or should we do is, then this is going to kind of lead us along the wrong path. And similarly, the word party has that same property, okay? So we can have a different number of attractors in between these two um, correctly matched words. 
Um, and we can take sentences that are extracted from a corpus to try and look at this, or we could actually construct sentences with very specific properties. And those have both been done. Um, they have different sorts of properties, right? So if we look at sentences from a corpus, they tend to have, in between the target noun and verb, a relatively small number of words and a relatively small number of attractors. Uh, because in general, you know, sentences with very, lo very long distance dependencies are fairly rare. Um, nevertheless, they do occur. Um, and it's certainly possible to construct these examples in ways that are not completely unnatural. Right? So you can construct sentences that control for various factors like that. And you can also control for things like what particular kind of linguistic structure is intervening. Right? So this is an example, the officer near the skater's laughs, where this part of the sentence is what's called a prepositional phrase, so it has a preposition here. Right? So it's a particular kind of um, intervention, you know, intervening word, uh, phrase, versus this one, which is what's called a relative clause, the officer that loves the skater's laughs. Right? So it's slightly different linguistic structure. Right, so we can control for you know, particular kinds of linguistic structures, and we can also, as I said, control for things like how much stuff is coming in between. Right, so we can have a conjunction with the word and. The officer smiles and laughs. That's a short conjunction because there's not much in between. But we could also say the officer writes in a journal every day and laughs. This is a long conjunction, both because it has a lot of words in between, but also because there are a couple of attractors in between as well. So they constructed a bunch of sentences that sort of have these different properties to sort of really test different, um, you know, aspects of this. Um, the models that they were testing were trained on 90 million words of Wikipedia text. And then what they did was basically compare, to, to explicitly test the models, they had them compare the probabilities of two different sequences that differed only in the verb agreement, right? So they had the model compute its predicted probability for a sentence like the officer near the skater's laughs versus the officer near the skater's laugh. And just say, okay, does this RNN actually assign higher probability to the correct option, this one? And of course, you can also have humans do the same task, and so you can figure out, you know, first of all, how well is the RNN doing in comparison to the human, and secondly, does it have similar patterns of errors? Um, and so basically what they found um, initially was that when, we're, when you're looking at examples from a large corpus, which as I said in some ways are kind of simpler than these constructed examples, um, the RNN accuracy is actually not that much below humans. So it's about 92% versus humans that are about 94.5. Um, when you look at how many attractors there are in the sentence, it turns out that having attractors in the sentence actually makes humans do worse also, because you know, even though in principle we kind of know what's grammatical and what isn't, there are you know, effects of attention and memory and all kinds of things. Um, but the sort of drop off in performance with more attractors is actually fairly similar for the humans and the RNNs. So initially they kind of came off and you know, they said, oh, actually it looks like RNNs are doing pretty well on this. Um, but actually if you look at those constructed examples, you suddenly find very, very big differences. Um, so th several types of these constructed examples, and by types what I mean is like, is it a prepositional phrase or a you know, long conjunction or a short conjunction? Um, several types of those, um, the RNN was kind of getting less than 60% correct, where it, these constructed examples, 50% is chance, right? So getting less than 60 is really bad. Um, whereas humans were getting above 80% on some of those same examples, you know? So admittedly they were hard, um, but not nearly as hard as the RNN thinks they are. So the conclusion here seems to be that RNNs are you know, quite good at common examples, but they don't seem to kind of generalize from that to encode this sort of structure more generally um, in the same way that humans do. Um, now you might ask, okay, well that's an RNN, you know, that's a particular kind of architecture. Uh, maybe if I use a different architecture, it would have a different inductive bias and I would get some different results. Um, so there's also some papers that have actually looked at comparing RNNs to other neural network architectures. Um, one of these is known as a recurrent neural network grammar. Um, so this is actually developed by some unsurprisingly NLP researchers who wanted to kind of come up with a way of explicitly encoding this hierarchical structure. Um, and they do that through what I call structure building actions. So um, in other words, if you have something like a shift reduce parser, um, the structure building actions are the kind of the shift and the reduce actions there. 
right? So the problem with this is that it actually needs to train on sentences that have parse trees. Um, so it's not like it's kind of learning that hierarchical structure from nothing. You kind of have to tell it right off the bat and put that into the training data. Um, nevertheless, um, you know, it does, you know, sort of build this, uh, uh, you know, it, one would hope that it would kind of build this structure and learn this structure and then you be able to use it on um, new sentences where you don't provide the parse tree. Um, and the other um, example that people have looked at is something called a fully attentional network or a transformer architecture. Uh, many of you have probably heard about this, right? This is a, an architecture that doesn't have any recurrent um, connections, um, but it does have an, this attention mechanism which serves us arguably serves a similar purpose, which is supposed to allow um, the output of the model to basically be able to look at any of the um, inputs at any particular time step and, and have any of those words influence all of the other decisions that are being made. Um, and it has been demonstrated to work really well for machine translation, so you might ask, okay, well, maybe it can, you know, maybe it's learning this hierarchical structure. Um, and so what we see if we actually look at those two models is that the um, RNNG, which recall was actually trained on examples that you know, told it the structure, um, does seem to work better than RNNs. Right? So what you can see here on this plot is the number of attractors that come between the noun and the verb in the sentence that are supposed to agree with each other. Um, and there's two different um, LSTM models here on the left and the RNN grammar on the right. So you can see that the error rate, that's what's being shown, the error rate of the RNN grammar is much lower um, and rises, or rises more slowly as the number of attractors um, goes up. Right? So it seems like it's better able to deal with that hierarchical structure. Um, interestingly, um, if we look at the comparison between the RNN and the fully attentional network, um, this paper suggests that Actually, the fully attentional network, despite having similar overall language modeling performance to the RNN, actually is worse at learning this hierarchical structure, right? So this is um, language model, this is the um, accuracy of these models uh, depending on the number of words between the noun and the verb, and this is depending on the number of attractors between the noun and the verb, right? So it doesn't matter if you look at words or if you look at attractors, um, in either case, the accuracy of the fully attentional network, you know, decreases faster than the accuracy of the RNN, okay? So, again, it seems like, you know, even though overall it's been argued that these fully attentional networks, you know, perform very well, they do well in language modeling, etc., it seems like they are not capturing the same kinds of things as the recurrent network. Okay, so I, I have these little uh, asterisks up here. <laughs> I should say what those asterisks are. Um, asterisks are, you know, even though I'm telling you this, you shouldn't necessarily believe me. Um, so I think it's really great that lots of people are out there, you know, trying to actually understand better what the inductive biases of these different models are and, you know, comparing them in these ways. However, um, any single paper that says, oh, this model is better than this model or has this inductive bias and this one doesn't or whatever, it's hard to believe any single paper because as we all know, the performance of any model is a very complex function of the architecture as well as the training regimes. Um, and I think there's been you know, some nice work recently showing that improvements that people have claimed that were due to better architectures are often later found to come either partly or largely from simultaneously adding particular training tricks. Um, so there's this paper by Mellish et al. Um, uh, comparing uh, LSTM, uh, based, you know, pretty standard LSTM uh, models versus loads of other things that were way more complicated and that people said were much better. Um, and they showed that, you know, there certainly are regimes in which you can actually do just as well or better with the LSTMs as you can with the other things. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that those things are equal, right? It could be that it does take a lot more hyperparameter tuning and so forth to get the LSTM to work as well, right? So that still would argue that some other model might have a better inductive bias. Um, but this is why these things are quite difficult to tease apart. Um, and this other paper by Chen et al. is actually about machine translation and they were comparing um, transformer architecture versus RNNs, I believe. Um, and also kind of showing that there really a lot of the 
benefits of the transformer architecture were due to other kinds of things, and they kind of come up with this paper where they combine you know, the things that worked, that they found worked well in this paper and the things that they found worked well in that paper and sort of came up with something even better, right? So you just have to generally be quite, um, you know, as I said, wary of these kinds of claims. Um, as I said, if you do ha really have a model with good inductive bias, it should be easy to train over a wide range of hyperparameters. Um, the problem is that, you know, the amount of effort that it takes a researcher to kind of tweak your model it's really hard to quantify and it's hard to control for, right? We're, we all have a tendency to spend a lot more tweaking effort on the model that we think is new and better and not so much on the baseline. Um, so I think it's a bit tricky. Um, I don't think there's any clear winners yet despite what I've sort of tried to argue already. Um, I do th am somewhat hopeful that, you know, with lots of people out there working on this that effectively we're all sort of doing a community-based MCMC, um, you know, if you read enough papers, you kind of get some sense of like the likely, you know, the probability that you think this thing is better than that thing, and so you're more likely to do that thing, but some people will still do the other thing and explore the other possibilities, and eventually, hopefully, we all get to the global maximum. Um, maybe. Um, as I said, I'm, I'm kind of hopeful about that, but it can take a while. Um, okay, so summarizing um, what I was saying about syntactic structure, um, with different, sorry, with similar amounts of data, different networks really do generalize quite differently, um, and small differences on corpus data can hide pretty big differences um, in implicit knowledge and um, generalization. So even networks that perform really well uh, in practice on lots of tasks don't necessarily learn hierarchical syntactic structure. Um, and, you know, human-like language processing does actually require human-like generalization, um, not just getting the stuff that's very frequent correct. So, you know, I think that sometimes those differences can, you know, may mean the difference between a model that can do very well on data that's similar to what it's been trained on versus a model that does well across different domains and different genres. Um, let me see how I'm doing on time. Um, I'm trying to decide if I want to do my part about subword structure or about pre-training and multilingual models because I probably don't have time to do both of them. Um, I think I'll talk about this and we'll see how I go. Um, okay, so the kind of second example that's, that I wanted to talk about that again is sort of related to do these models actually learn what we think they're learning or what we want them to learn is about subword structure. Um, that I talked about a little bit earlier, right? So we want us to be able to say that the probability of she is plecting is higher than the probability of she is plection, right? Um, and our ends with words as inputs directly, you know, don't actually solve this. So we, you know, lots of people probably are familiar with this example of um, the neural networks um, where you can, they can solve these analogy tasks, right? So if you give them um, a pair like king and kings, and then you say, okay, what's the analogous thing to kings for the word queen? They come back and say queens, okay. But how are they actually learning it? They're not actually learning it by knowing anything about the subword structure. They're actually learning it from the context, right? So what they can do is for frequent words like king, kings, it, these models can infer morphological relationships um, so these kinds of subword structures using the context, but for rare or unseen words, they can't actually infer um, contexts using the subword information, right? So it works well for frequent words, but not so well for rare or unseen words. And so the question is, uh, you know, how do we solve that problem, right? So if we're coming from an NLP perspective, then we might say something like, oh, we should use morphology. I'll explain what that is in a second. If we're coming from a more machine learning perspective, then maybe the answer is, oh, we just drop down a level and use characters. Okay, so let me explain a little bit what I mean by morphology. Um, so morphology basically is the linguistic term for regularities in the subword structure of words. So it th is things like inflection, right? So in English, we have uh, walk versus walking, or if we've never seen the word plect, but we could still say, well, if there's some verb plect, then it you know, has a continuous form that's plecting. Um, we have a uh, number that I've talked about already, kid, kids. Um, in English, we don't actually have a lot of inflection, so the only case that we have is genitive, right? So we can say kid versus kids or book, books. Um, 
most of you probably speak some other language besides English, and you may be familiar with lots of other cases, um, like accusative or uh, instrumental or various other things. Um, we also have things like derivation, right? So we can have regular uh, relationships like organize, organization, plec, plection, again, for a novel word, um, and compounds, right? So if we want to actually have access to this information in the kind of linguistic sense, it does require annotation, right? So we can segment words into things that are called morphemes, right? The kind of um, smallest units of meaning that make up those words, or we can tag the words with uh, information like what the inflectional forms are, right? So we could have a particular verb in English and say, you know, this has this aspect and this number, and if it's a noun, it has this case. Um, so in contrast to that, we might have a character-based model, right? So the positive aspects of a character-based model is that it doesn't need any linguistic knowledge or annotation required, right? It can model out of vocabulary words, novel words, um, and in principle, it can learn morphological relationships, but again, we'll see whether that's actually true in practice. And you know, the vocabulary size relative to a word-based model is much, much smaller, um, so obviously that has computational benefits. Um, on the other hand, it also has sort of computational trade-offs, right? So the input sequences now become very long, which means in pr that it can be a lot slower or harder to train, um, and arguably it's kind of both statistically and computationally inefficient, in the sense that you know we kind of know that words are meaningful, and so insisting that the model has to kind of relearn that information seems a bit wasteful. Um, and in practice, it turns out that these models are not always better than word-level models. Um, so in fact, there's also this kind of in-between position, right? We have these hybrid or in-between models, um, and these are slightly different things. So we can have hybrid models that sort of simultaneously um, have access to both word and character information or sort of try and model both of these those things at the same time. Um, or we can use um, units that are kind of in between the size of characters and words. Um, and sometimes those are based on very simple heuristics like in this Mikolov paper. Um, and actually, I guess you guys heard, heard lots of stuff about compression yesterday, so it turns out you can also use compression-based based techniques um, to try and identify these subword chunks as in this uh, Senrik et al. paper. Okay. So these kinds of models sort of combine the benefits of both characters and words, which is really nice, and in fact they're used in practice a lot now, um, because they often work better than either. Um, but we can still ask whether these models are actually learning effectively the same thing that linguistic knowledge of morphology gives us. Um, and so there's a couple of papers that actually compared um, different models, um, ones that use characters, ones that use words, ones that use these unsupervised subword units, and importantly, they also compared those directly to models that also incorporated hand annotated morphological information. Um, and they did sort of two different papers, one on language modeling and one on dependency parsing. Both of them used a range of different languages, which is important because as I said, English is actually not a very morphologically rich language, and so you're not going to get much um, information by just testing on English. So they looked at a lot of more um, richer languages. Um, and what they found was that actually morphological information was not redundant. Right? So they found, first of all, that because they were looking at these pretty morphologically complex languages, that the character-based models did actually beat the word-based models in their experiments. And the difference between the subword models and the character-based models tended to vary a little bit depending on which language they were looking at. Um, but in all the cases, maybe not all the cases, in most of the cases, and certainly on average, what they found was that models that actually incorporated gold standard annotation about morphology actually worked better than all of the um, other options. Okay. So, okay, so you say, well, yeah, but, you know, those are kind of small data sets, right? They're less than two million words. Like, we're way beyond that now, right? So maybe we just need more training data. Uh, so there was a actually more recent paper that did something very similar with larger data, right? So they developed a model that includes word character, words, characters, and gold standard morphology, um, and they trained on um, up to 40 million words in some of these languages. And they still found basically the same result, right? That using words plus characters plus morphology all in the model was better than models that didn't have the morphology component. Okay, 
So the other thing that was interesting here was that they actually did some nice error analysis. Um, and they found that they, they kind of looked at particular sentences where the character-based RNN did better than the model with morphology or vice versa. And what they found was that in the cases where the character RNN was pre better predicting the sentence probability, that the average word frequency in those sentences was about 3,000, right? So each of the words in those sentences had a, on average, a frequency in the corpus of 3,000. And in the cases where the model with gold standard morphology was doing better, the average word frequency in the sentence was about a factor of 10 lower. Right. So in fact, there is some evidence here that you know, the morphology is definitely more useful for cases where we have less data available to us. Okay, so you could say from this, okay, well, yeah, so you've shown that morphology is still useful at you know, 40 million words, but hey, we're up to billions of words now. Right? So maybe we just need even more data. Right? It's true that some neural network language models are now trained on billions of words. And so yeah, maybe they do already or will eventually learn morphology. I mean, I don't actually know, you know, these, these billion word models haven't been tested on these things, so I don't know. Um, but now we're starting to get into the regime where I think we need to be a little bit worried about learning efficiency, right? Four-year-old children, you know, based on um, various uh, studies that sort of look at kids in, you know, different socioeconomic status, background, and so forth, I think this was in all in North America, but you know, sort of at the top end of what they're hearing, those four-year-old kids have maybe heard up to, but often less than, uh, 50 million words. Um, so if we're looking at models that are being trained on billions of words, right, that's like you know, at least 10 times as much. Um, now it's probably true that those language models have much, 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 much larger vocabularies than the four-year-old kids do. Um, but it's not so clear that they're actually a lot better at morphology. Well, they're probably better at morphology than four-year-olds. But, you know, if we think, okay, well, ten times that amount of data is, like, you know, definitely a grown adult. Um, and, you know, that grown adult definitely knows morphology. So we start, as I said, we start to be a little bit worried about whether these models really have the right inductive bias if they need that much data to learn some of these things. Um, and also, as I'll talk more about... Um, in my talk tomorrow, it's not clear that having billions of words of data is always a feasible option. Um, it's certainly feasible for English, if you're Google, <laughs> and you have loads of compute resource. Um, but for many other languages, you know, getting the data is potentially a problem, and the compute resource needed may also be a problem. Okay. So, summarizing that bit on uh, subword structure, We've seen that subword structure is very important in order to be able to correctly model rare and novel words. Um, but as with syntax, there seems to be some evidence that these networks don't actually learn it very easily or very or completely. Um, so very large data sets clearly do help, but it would be nice if we had better models as well as better data sets. Now, unfortunately, at the moment, we don't. Um, so I'll talk kind of briefly about a few alternatives that um, people, you know, are doing these days that at least seem like interesting ways of kind of approaching some of these problems. Right, so if we don't know how to build in the right inductive biases, we can still try and improve NLP by using big data to help with small data, right? So what I mean by that is methods like using unsupervised pre-training uh, to try and reduce the amount of data that's needed when we have a supervised task where we don't have a lot of data or doing things like multilingual training to improve performance on low resource languages. Um, and I'll give a little bit more detail about each of those. Um, so unsupervised pre-training. So what does this mean? Basically what this means is we pre-train a giant language model on you know, a billion or more words, and we try and leverage it for some supervised tasks like parsing or question answering or whatever, where we, as I said, don't necessarily have lots of annotated data for that particular supervised task. Um, and there's a couple ways that people have done this. So one is you could use a pre-trained model and output context-sensitive embeddings and input those to a task-specific neural network. So essentially what you're doing is um, you train, so ELMO is a recurrent network, so you train a really big recurrent network with multiple layers, 
Um, and in fact, they argue in this paper that the different layers are sort of capturing different levels of linguistic structure. So some of them are kind of more at the word level, and some of them are a little bit more syntactic-y, and some of them are more semantic-y. Um, so you've got, you know, you sort of learn, learn this um, representation based on your uh, language modeling task, and then you can, you know, in your supervised task, sort of plug your task-specific architecture into the top of that model and just sort of say, okay, I've got my, um, you know, I, I run my sequence of words through this pre-trained model to get the representations, and then those representations go as input to my uh, task-specific model. And so the only thing that I actually um, train for my specific task is this top layer, which is now task specific. Right. And then a slightly different way that people have done this is you actually um, fine tune the entire model. Right. So you pre-train the model with exactly the same architecture as what you have for your, for your task. So you may have to kind of figure out how to you know, represent your task in the input in some particular way. Um, and then you fine tune the model on that. And there's a few examples of that that have come out recently that work, seem to work really well. Um, so all of these, I will say, are, are definitely pushing forward the state of the art on a lot of um, NLP tasks. So that's one way we could do it. They're very successful in practice. They haven't had any analysis yet on you know, these questions about morphology or implicit and syntactic structure learning. I think it would be a really interesting thing to look at. Um, the other thing is, you know, I actually am not aware of any giant pre-trained models on languages other than English. There might be some, because this is all coming out very, very recently. Um, but you know, this is obviously an, also an issue, right? It's great if we can do NLP on English, but it would be even better if we could do it on not just English. Um, so the other way that people have been looking at that is uh, multilingual training. Um, so there's a few different domains in which people are looking at multilingual training. So here's an example from machine translation. Um, so the idea here is that we train a single model to translate between any two languages, right? So a standard machine translation model, we give it parallel data to train on, for example, you know, a bunch of sentences in English and their Spanish translations, right? So we would then train some kind of encoder-decoder model that takes in the English sentence, encodes it into some kind of hidden representation, which the decoder then decodes back into Spanish. Um, and the insight in this paper is actually surprisingly simple, which is that you, know, you can actually train a model not just to translate from English to Spanish, but by just prepending this little tag here that tells the model what language you want to get in the output, you can also input data from, let's say, uh, parallel English, French training data, right? Where you say, oh, now you need to you know, train on this and it's going to be going into French, and you can give it German-French data, which again, you know, it, it basically has to infer for itself that the input is in German, but you tell it, I want the output to be in French. So you kind of give this same model loads and loads of data um, that consist of parallel sentences, but in all kinds of different languages. Um, and the thing that's actually pretty surprising is that this single model where they trained it with N input languages and M output languages, is, it is a little bit worse in terms of translation performance than if you trained separate models, you know, just an English-Spanish model and just a German-French model. Um, but the reason that it's surprising that it's only a little bit worse is because actually the total amount of data that they used and the, t and the model size that they used were actually the same as a single, let's say, English-Spanish model, right? So, the number of examples that it had for any particular language pair was actually much less than the, um, uh, than the single models. And you also have a big win because you only have to train a single model instead of n by n models, right? So if you're Google, which they are, um, <laughs> you, know, you've, you want to deal with 100 different languages in your translation engine, you don't want to have to train 100 times 100 different systems especially because a lot of those language pairs have very little parallel data for them, right? So they're, they're using this to, to have a kind of really big win here. Um, and they kind of say at the end of the paper, yeah, we did a little bit worse, but if we increase the model size or the training time, we could probably improve it. Um, this paper came out you know, a year and a half ago. I can only assume that they have done that, um, although they haven't published since then, so I don't know. Um, and I'll talk uh, about some other examples from multilingual training with speech recognition um, tomorrow.
Um, okay, so what are some remaining issues? Um, I just want to very briefly touch on one thing that I think also brings up something that NLP can hopefully help us with. Um, so neural networks have actually, um, you know, as I've shown here, really rapidly advanced the state of the art, and that's great. Um, the problem is that I think sometimes our test sets and evaluation standards haven't actually kept up with those advances. And so what happens then is if you're using the kind of, you know, 10-year-old evaluation protocol or test set, it may be that, you know, just doing that without really thinking about it, you may end up actually overclaiming or being tempted to overclaim in your results. Um, so I, don't, I, I kind of hate to like pick on one particular paper, but um, here's just one example. I know a lot of NLP researchers who got really angry about this paper. Um, so the paper was called Achieving Human Parity on Automatic Chinese to English News Translation. Um, and, you know, lots of NLP people kind of looked at this and they were like, mm, I don't think so. Um, you know, they're very skeptical of this title and certainly, you know, after reading the paper, I, well, I'll explain in a minute, like, where this issue came from. But, you know, I think the problem is that now that NLP and machine learning in general are fields that, you know, the general public actually knows a lot more about and is very interested in because these systems are actually out there in practice, um, the problem is if you publish a paper like this, it's not just researchers who are going to see that paper, right? It's the news people, right? So there were headlines like Microsoft researchers match human levels in translating news from Chinese to English. Um, and I think the problem is that, you know, there's really an ethical issue here, right? We don't, as researchers, we don't want to be, um, you know, making claims that make people think that if they use our translation system, it's going to be as good as a human at translating that, or that they can have that kind of expectation, because first of all, you know, if it does make errors, they're going to be disappointed, and secondly, you know, we have, AI has gotten itself into trouble before by kind of overhyping things, and then people found out that it wasn't quite there, and then, you know, bad stuff happened, right? So I think there's, you know, we want to be a little bit careful about that. Okay, so what was the issue here? Well, the problem here was that they um, were using, you know, a, a fairly standard, well, I mean, they came up with sort of their own evaluation method, but it was something that would have been completely reasonable, um, you know, until fairly recently, which is that they were evaluating isolated sentences, right? So they would give um, humans uh, a pair of sentences, one that was translated by, well, they would show them the original, I guess they would show them the original Chinese, and then they would show them the translation from the machine, and they would show them a human translation of that single sentence. Right? And what they showed was that the humans, you know, in their evaluation of how good those were, there was no statistically significant difference between the machine and the human evaluation. However, um, you know, it turns out that evaluating things in isolation is no longer good enough. Right? So the nice thing here is that they actually released their data. Right? So props to them for doing that. Um, and that meant that other people could actually do some further analysis. And so there's this nice paper that follows up on that and shows that Actually, if you give people these translations in the context of what they were translating, right, so they have some information about, you know, the discourse or the um, article or whatever that it occurred in, then human evaluators at that point do actually still prefer the human translations, right, because machine translation systems are still not at the point where they can deal with things like, um, you know, disambiguating things in context or figuring out what pronouns are supposed to refer to and that kind of thing. Um, so there's been some follow-up work there proposing uh, new test sets that are actually giving sort of targeted evaluation of this kind of discourse phenomena um, and talking about how to deal with that in machine translation. So I think this is actually one of the places where we actually do really still need NLP researchers and people who have a kind of um, nuanced understanding about the domain in particular, right, is, in, is in developing these kind of new test sets and new evaluation methods. Um, so one really nice example of that, um, this was a workshop at an ACL conference, I think, last year, um, and I'm hoping that they'll continue to do this, is this kind of build it, break it, adversarial shared task, right? So this is not a GAN, this is an adversary as a human adversary, right? Um, right so we basically have this shared task, and the idea is that some people who are involved in this shared task are builders, so they try and build a system that's as good and as robust as they can for this task, but then simultaneously, some of the people who enter this workshop are breakers, and they're trying to come up with linguistically motivated examples that are, you know, good examples, 
um, but things that actually break the system. Right? And so that helps everyone to try and understand like what are these systems actually good at and what are they bad at and what should we, we be working on. Um, okay, so sort of conclude, do we still need NLP? Well, as I've said, I think the power of neural networks to model word similarity and to capture frequent patterns um, really is enough, in fact, more than enough to outperform older probabilistic models. So I think, you know, it's pretty clear that we've, you know, we're, we're, we're over the deep learning skepticism in NLP and we're, you know, we're all in. Um, nevertheless, um, those earlier models, I think, were based on linguistic insights that these new neural network models don't seem to fully learn. And we've been able to sort of partially overcome this by massive pre-training or transfer learning, but it's um, not clear yet entirely how far this is going to go. And so what I would argue is that until then, having that domain knowledge about language really can still help us. And it helps us uh, in the longer term and the sort of harder task, which is building models with task-specific architectures or input encodings that hopefully should have better inductive biases. But even in the shorter term, it helps us to design better evaluations to test hard cases and avoid overclaiming things. Um, and so that's what I'll leave you with. And it looks like I've got a few minutes for questions. So thanks very much.